Welcome. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. And I'm Sylvia Earle, National Geographic explorer in residence and ocean elder and founder of Mission Blue. This is our show, Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community around topics of wonder and interest. Before we start, a bit of housekeeping, as there are many people from all around the world who will be joining us today. Um, you'll be able to ask questions by writing into the Q&A box, and then later on in the program we'll try to answer as many of those as we can. Uh, we'll also have the uh, raise your hand feature enabled today, and depending how times goes, we'll uh, try to get through those questions too. And throughout the conversation there'll be some links in the uh, in the uh, Q&A box and the chat box that you can reference. I am now going to try to come and share my screen. Yay. Amazing it worked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm amazed every time. Um, let's see, today we are going well, to, uh, oh, wait, oh yeah. All right, yeah, oh, go ahead. <laughs> it's that we image. always start with the earth rise because it reminds us that the world is blue. Blue, blue, <laughs> never forget. Today we're going to be welcoming back Amos Nahum, mm -hmm. and during our Sharktober episodes, we saw a number of his images, and he also shared some of the images on the uh, whale episode and some right. others. Um, and today, uh, Amos is going to turn his camera and video on and join us, and we're going to talk about how he got some of those shots and how to ethically observe the animals uh, without causing them undue stress. Oh, there he is, the there big animal. There he is, is, the big animal himself. <laughs> Let's, uh... Together with Herr Deppness and the lady that keep us all in order, Liz Taylor. <laughs> so it's time to dive in. Uh -oh, nope. What's going on here? Dive in. Oh, there we are. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. Um, let's see this guy. Yes. So together with Sylvie in 1980, um, she was a guest of mine, and I had a chance to take her or have her join me in the Red Sea. And the influence that she put over me was tremendous and the fact of the matter, the friendship that continued till today. But rather than looking at small fish and botany of the sea, as Sylvie is known for, at least I know of, <laughs> I went to look at something big. So together with Sylvia and Liz and all of you guys, and thank you for participating, I'm going to share with you and um, Sylvia with her input about the ocean giant and how to be able to enjoy them, but with harmony and with right. passion. And, you know, the whales, I mean, now we've largely stopped killing them and people increasingly are wanting to go out and directly experience uh, swimming with them, documenting them, and the blue whales the biggest animal to ever live. <laughs> um, what can you tell us about getting into the water with these guys almost? I mean, how can we do this in a in a way that's really sensitive to the nature of these um, actually very um, sensitive animals? Just to start with the idea that this a modern time dinosaur. During the dinosaur time, blue world could not exist and now it exists now. Over 30 meter, 100 feet, 100 feet in length, the heart is the size of a beetle Volkswagen. So there are four or five locations around the world which are very, quite well known. And because of the pandemic, less noise pollution in the ocean, there is a chance to see them more often and relatively easy. In this case, I'm here off the Coronado Island, looking at the migration of the blue whale along the coast of Mexico, Baja California, uh, California, all the way to Washington and to Alaska. In this case, we see a very rare moment of three of them together as usually blue whale or solitaire. But that's from the air. As we go to the water to interact with such an acoustic animal, we need to use a vehicle that is very quiet. In this case, it's a kayak. On this particular case, it was a sleeping blue whale. And the person that I went with, a Mexican fisherman, actually used his rows in order to get close very close to the blue. And this is out of Baja. And if we go for the next one, is the picture of a sleep, another sleeping blue whale. So <laughs> the idea 
again is to be quiet, small group. Like in my, in my line of business, I take only four people with me on those kind of trip, only one or two people at a time, closely, quietly reaching to the animal, swimming and actually on the side so you don't kick the ocean and make noise. And that's right. out in Sri Lanka. It's such a, an amazing shot, you know, you, people, face. it's just, it's such a great face. You know, we usually see them with their, you know, with their, their throat pouch all extended or um, some other uh, aspect, but not really just this kind of head on view. It's just beautiful. Snoozy. Especially for Sylvie, because Sylvie mentioned the last time she liked to see the face. Every animal have its own face. It's <laughs> true. It is true. Uh, and here we are with the, and, the, the tool of choice. Are. Especially, so to get there with a big boat is difficult. <clears throat> to get there with a speedboat is even more difficult or harassing the animal. But what about if we see them from a mile away, stop the big boat, put the kayak in the water, put a kayaker sitting behind, promoting us, the photographer or the guest or the researcher sitting in the front of the kayak and then waiting in the open water, mile or two mile apart, and then the blue will just, as they migrate, if we go in the right time of the year, and that's the study that I will make, what is the right time of the year to be in Timor-Leste, to be in Costa Rica Dome, or to be in California, or in Sri Lanka? And then to be able, as the blue will come very close, slide into the water, just be there, just actually hover in the water, and the blue will just pass by you. And Unfortunately, yeah, right. and, you're, and you're snorkeling here too, so we're not with you know the bubbles and tanks and things that would be kind of obtrusive, a, obtrusive to the animal. So you're just kind of exactly. more as a quiet observer. Exactly, it's all by being as quiet as we can, and only on the free diving or snorkeling. It's and like there are, like different, a whale. there are different the sperm whale, they're different than humpback whale. They are not as interactive. They will not give us time but they will just pass by. But to be in the water in, a, in the company of an animal that is 100 feet long, even 60 feet long, 70, 80, it is like. <laughs> <laughs> it's just incredible. Well, we'll see the next picture or two. And here you see a picture was taken of me swimming with the blue whale. And this is what probably what they call the pygmy blue whale out of mm -hmm. Sri Lanka. And that is a plan. Sylvie, that uh, I'm working with the guy in Sri Lanka to have you join me in March of 2022. Oh, by then and, we should be free. To, to plan yeah. ahead to be there in Sri Lanka to see them. Fantastic. Yes, I'm in. All right. I'm all for it. Still working on it. <laughs> yeah. I, I love this shot because it really shows how the blue whale can is so camouflaged in the environment as well. Blue on blue. Blue on blue, and now they just sort of can almost uh, disappear into the into the blue. And the, the, the pigmentation of the blue, well, each one of them is very different than the other. And Richard Sears, the researcher, is the one that uh, starts this particular pattern and identify them beside the tail, but also by the pigmentation on the side of the blue on the left or the right hand side. Well, everyone is distinctive, just as every human. Yeah, it's getting to know what to look for, and then you know who to look for. <laughs> well, there is another another time. This is the diver that I trained in Sri Lanka in 2008 when the war with the Tamil just ended or semi ended, and I start going there to develop or helping them develop the understanding awareness of their potential of the treasure being with the blue whale. It really is a treasure. To think. We used to think they were only good for <laughs> products. So if we have a picture of the blue whale face, now we have the blue whale actually feeding with yeah. the <laughs> And this is how we usually see them depicted, even in you know, even in, in Natural History Museum or in books. Uh, people like to show them with the in the feeding position with the right. big pouch extended. You don't usually see pictures of pelicans with a big pouch extended. <laughs> But with, with the blue whales, yeah. Yeah, they tend to do that, don't they? Mm. But, what... but again, all this, can we can only reach it by having only one or two person in the water, not pushing against the animal, but always parallel to the animal, shadow right. them, 
never fought, not forcing them and not closing their way, let them pass through, give them 350 degree if we can hold only 30 degree of the ocean. Mm hmm. Hmm. Goodness. Look at that magnificent face. And that is just took my breath away as as I was sitting on the kayak, I just the blue whale just came by the kayak inches away. I put the camera in the water and I took the picture without even knowing what I'm doing. Well, I knew what I'm doing, but <laughs> I was not sure that I know what I'm doing. It's getting to be able to catch the eye and the whole mouse and the whole it was just <laughs> so special. It's more than luck. That's skill. Knowing what Thank to you. do at, mm -hmm. with the right setting, the right time, and not hesitating, just doing it. Right. And here is a story that uh, I share together with Liz, and Liz and I share about the issue of the, what to call it, the threat the blue whale exists. Uh, just, for, just for relationship to understand, or for all, all of the, our people here, there were over 300,000 blue whale in the turn of the century. And today is about only 15 or 17,000 left. Yeah. But they're still suffering a tremendous amount of impact by the by the uh, shipping lane and the, how they get injured. Liz, would you please share with us some more of your observation and the yeah. next picture or two? Yeah, so what happens so frequently these whales, even though they're, you know, they're immense in size and we see how they kind of blend and fade away into the water, their defense mechanism when they get, become scared I don't hear you anymore. Do we have a problem with sound? Can you hear me? Now I hear you, yes. I'm okay, okay. But the blue whale, they, they kind of freeze up in the water column. They don't run away. They don't run away. Swim away. They don't swim <laughs> away. And it leaves them very vulnerable to being hit by the ships. And I think that's what we're seeing in this image. There's nothing in their history that's prepared them for what we have put into the ocean. And it's it's, ship traffic, it's plastic, it's the, the new hurdles that they have to contend with aside from har harpoons. <laughs> but, you know- yeah, More it, than one way to kill a whale. Yeah, and the speed at which many of these uh, cargo ships or even fishing vessels are traveling at, uh, the whale freezes up, it has no opportunity to to move out of the way. It's not in its, in its uh, normal be. behavior to, to move out of the way and they and they're hit. And of course the impact does massive damage to them, um, just internal bleeding or damages their organs and they frequently will uh, you know, just end up dying like this one. And that was the case in Sri Lanka uh, wow. where the, this blue whale was heated and as you see it laying on its side rather than swimming freely. Right, so it's you know, clearly either it's wounded, wounded and it either a is- wounded whale. Mm -hmm. laid over on its side it can no longer breathe and so it either dies from its injuries or from drowning or oh, it died from its injury the injury was severe severe and, okay. it, and as you see here one of my guests as i said only the guest that you saw before only one person at a time um, out of uh, respect to the animal in this case took a picture of me there swimming and to see the, to see the size of this magnificent animal it took so many years to live and just one hit. And yeah, it's no. gone. It's just, yeah, I mean, these animals are long lived, you know, well into the 100 year mark that we know of. And just to, to think about that, to all the things that it's endured and survived over the span of time, um, only to be end up being, you know, hit by a ship bringing us, you know, it's like a traffic accident. Yeah, it's a, exactly. Um, and, you know, there are solutions for this. It's not as if we don't know what to do. We know that when we're in a shipping, you know, when whales are in the shipping lanes that we either move the ships out further, we slow them down. Um, there are different kinds of collision avoidance technology that can be used to uh, help avoid this sort of a situation. But it's, it all comes down to um, time and money. Yeah, People are just trying desire to, to do it, desire yeah. to get goods to market faster. Um, and the whales are just kind of collateral damage and it's it's really wrong. <laughs> there are no whales to waste at this point. Yeah. Th they that's one of the purpose or the reason that I wanted, and I 
plan on uh, vigorously to get Sylvie uh, to Sri Lanka in 2012 in March and to be able to share not just my experience and the images, but also her leadership and impose and work with the government to protect this beautiful, am amazing animal. If you look at it, it is, there is, we could not design anything like that. No. no Tesla, no Apple, nobody can put something like that in the world. It is nature, which is second to none. It's such a wonderful photograph here. Just Thank showing you. the, just the, the sheer size and, and power and grace of the animal all in one image. It's ethereal. It really is. Mm. It's beautiful. Huh. Yeah. And, and we move to the exactly opposite. So exactly the opposite. I mean, the white shark, right? Made <laughs> famous and feared by Jaws. And most people that they're going diving with these sharks, they do so in a, in a cage. And oft, oftentimes they're you know, they're baiting the water. They're just trying to get the shark all spun up and, and riled up so that it- They get it, big pictures of teeth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this was 1974. They did not have good pictures, but they had to draw the picture to, to create the drama. In 1982, right. I was here in South Af in uh, actually in Australia, together with Rodney Fox, Jeannie right. Clark, David Dubillet, which we all know very well, great yeah. mentors for all of us, researchers. And we had to put bait in the water to get the shark coming in. Rodney was putting this tuna in the water and to get the shark out of the water and to take the picture. So um, I, I sent the picture to one of the stock agency in 1982, 83, and look for the next picture. They removed the fish. Yeah. <laughs> and now you have a very dramatic picture. It was the cover of Ocean Realm. It was in Life magazine, it was in Time. But look what happened next. 11 yeah. years later, 1993, the Discovery Advertising Agency found the picture in Image Bank, the company called Image Bank in New York. It's the same shark, isn't it? It's the same shark. They took the picture and they changed the, from horizontal to a vertical. Wow. Wow. And, but you because can see they wanted to create the connection between how Jaws was promoted right. and how to promote now Shark Week. Oh. The fear is embedded in our mind, even though we don't notice it for no yeah. reason, for no no correct reason. Right. It's just it's kind of just yeah. It's all just marketing manufactured. manufactured. Yeah, it, it's it's marketing, marketing. Okay. So I realize I have a responsibility as image maker or visual storyteller to tell the true story. Mm -hmm. So here we are diving this case in South Africa with a great white, and we are in a cage. And that's how we get to be with the shark and putting bait in the water. That's how we learn. Right. right? Oh. But being more and more in the water, I realized there is different behavior than what I was told and what I read. The seal and the shark was playing with each other. Actually, the seal was harassing the shark. <laughs> and the shark does not catch it. That's like, pulling on Superman's cape, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> and this is, was in Mexico, in Guadalupe, and uh, Mauricio, one of the researchers, the professor of shark behavior, was talking with us and sharing his knowledge because he'd been there for many months, every year, and was saying the shark does not feed more than once every three or four weeks. Yeah. And, and we see the shark and the seal playing with each other, and they are just living in the same space. There is no aggression. I decided to go out of the water. You became a seal. <laughs> I can be a seal. <laughs> and here you are, we took a cage, we put it down to 10, to 10 meters, 30 feet. Um, my client are inside the cage. I take only one person out with a safety diver behind me. And the shark just came by my side. And to see them uh, superimpose the shark against the cage. And if you all, if you have photographer here, you know the light in the water does not go more, maybe one meter, two right. meter. And that's how close I was. Oh, three feet to six feet. That's how close I was to the shark. Huh. You could touch her. Yeah. And you can just see that, you know, the shark is, is not, uh, I mean, it's looking at you, obviously, but it's, it's not displaying aggression. It's just kind of, a, you know, looking curious. Because we did not put bait in the water. When I re re put the cage deep in 10 meter, we, not put what, uh, we did not have to put bait anymore in the water. Right. None just the sound of the cage moving in the water 
and the thing bouncing against the cage, the sound of it, the noise, attract the shark to come in to see, to investigate. They are the policemen of the ocean. Yeah, they're curious. They're very curious and they just, yeah. they, just they need to come check it out and see what the heck's going on. Yeah. So I went out of the cage together with a safety diver behind me and he took a picture of me here. And if we have a photographer here, you know that in the water we only most of the time, if not all the time, use wide angle lenses, 35 millimeter, 20, 18, 15, 16 fisheye. And they're all distortion. There's always distortion to this animal. They are not look normal. Right. So, and as you see in the picture here, I am only maybe six feet. I'm only five, seven with fin, oh. I'm six. The shark is 15 feet long, looks smaller. I decide to use a normal lens, a 50 millimeter lens. <laughs> That's Why? A portrait lens. And the normal lens is exactly our view and to show everybody really what does that mean to be with a great white with no bait and no charm in the water, like here. And, and no 16 millimeter film. No. <laughs> or, or, or lens. Or lens, yeah. yeah. Only with a normal lens. And look what we got next. No, like, look at that. Oh my goodness. Smiling great face. white. Favorite shots. Three, <laughs> only three feet away between me and the animal, 50 millimeter lens, full frame, no crop, no changes, just the way it is. That's it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> it's another the next one. For you. Well, everybody said only maybe only one, but here is a second one, the same. <laughs> yeah. What a smile. Yeah. Every dentist office should have one of these. <laughs> <laughs> and, it's, and I think then you've got some images that show us that, you know, this really is a path forward with these guys, because this is what can happen sometimes. That is the unfortunate. And I must admit to the people that seeing that or are warning that these images are not easy to look at in the cage with the bait, we are aggravating the animal. We tease them. We make them angry, and they they get out of they get out of order. They just and they put themselves in this situation, and it is devastating. Unfortunately, my operation or my kind of operation is stopped because of money. It's not allowed to because it's unsafe. But look at this. Is another one, beautiful picture of by another friend of ours, a friend of you, Sylvie Orhe from Mexico. And he's swimming here, taking a picture of this great white swimming open with no cages, no bait, but the shark come, look at them and continue. Yeah, the shark, you know, we're really I not on their very, menu. We're, we're not really very appetizing. <laughs> no. <laughs> we're not appetizing, but this leadership, it, we need leadership. I don't suggest everybody to do it, need the leadership, preparation, organization, and skills to put it together. And then it worked very well. But it's so worthwhile. This it is the real thing. Worthwhile. Yeah. It's showing respect for the animals, and then and they respect you. Yeah, and I think it it really are. It's the kind of lesson that can carry over to you know no matter what animal you're trying to even other humans take a photograph of. But it's that showing that you know respect and distance and treat them with dignity and dignity. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That is how we have to deal with each other or in this case, back in South Africa, together with another mentor of mine, a remarkable individual, uh, Andre Hartmann. Unfortunately, today he's, he suffered two strokes, but still very dear in my heart and the people that were diving there or went diving there, the BBC and Geographic and mm -hmm. Netflix. But with him, we did one of the first, first diving 1992 and they're diving out of the cage and the shark just came past by our head. And I was, I did not have, think twice just to run after it to catch the silhouette of this shark. And well, so fantastic. it is like, <laughs> yeah. oh, just amazing. That's the image we should hold, not oh, one with a big mouth open. <laughs> Speaking of big mouths, yeah. you know, <laughs> this, the, these guys, the leopard seal, they, they've got this reputation as the most fearsome predator in Antarctica. And, you know, they get up to 12 feet in length and they can weigh a thousand pounds. And, you know, how do you approach thinking about getting into the water with a with an animal like this that, you know, just literally snaps up penguins for lunch? Only knowing that only one story ever happened, and that's so unfortunate and sadly to a female researcher, British, but she was told not to go out there to be with the, uh, with the leopard seal that she saw. She was told not to go, and she went by herself, no protection, no other people around her, and unfortunately, they got to an accident 
and from there on the reputation of a leopard seal, but it is not necessarily the truth. So when we went out there, I suggested that the people, first of all, not all of us together, only one or two people at the same time, but let's understand the animal. They are solitaire and they are territorial. So when they look at the camera, what they see, they see another, another leopard seal. <laughs> and of course they want to defend their territory and how they do it by open their mouths. Next one. What a mouth. <laughs> what a mouth. <laughs> so, I, so I'm telling my guys, guys, when you have a leopard seal, you don't go against it and you not run away. Just stay in one place. Let them get used to our present with them. And then we go just shadow them parallel to them to be able to see authentically how they live and what they do. And that's how they catch and feed on a penguin. I must, I must alert again for the viewer, if there are more young ones, they cannot see the behavior or the predation and how a leopard seal hunt. Please take your eyes a moment or three more or for two or three pictures from the yeah. next one. There's a couple scary, they're not scary, but. So, but what is our responsibility? My responsibility is not just to take beautiful picture and to be liking on Instagram or, on, uh, or Facebook. My responsibility is also as a researcher in a way with camera to be able to bring the truth about the behavior, the authentic behavior, the powerful behavior of, of this animal. So the leopard seal come and catch the penguin, pull it to the water, drown it two or three times, let it go and eventually take it back in and look at this, how it hold the bait or the penguin close to his neck and while looking at it into the camera. As long as we don't interfere with their behavior, as long as not push against them because wide angle lens, you want to be very close. You have to think twice what lens to put when you work with the animal. And here getting, close but on the side not interfering and see clearly how they use the canine teeth to scratch the skin of the the penguin in order to remove the feathers he cannot eat on feathers the feathers right. so he, he scratch the skin shake it violently in and out of the water and only then when the feather goes away it can feed mother nature is so it's just <laughs> how to believe is mind boggling how the animal finds solution for their survival. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's so, and it's so important that, you know, photographers can <laughs> um, get those sorts of images to help scientists understand. Uh, help anyone. Help anyone, anyone. understand anyone. You know, yeah. how they're, you know, how they do this and, and how those, how these connections work. Especially for children. If we have children watching us today, especially for the young one, not to get so much in line with the fear of the adult. Understand, take every animal, every subject, study it, learn about it, uh, be curious, and then go out and follow it. And here in the picture, when the animal feed, they feel very happy to play with us. Yeah. Like it's a blow bubble in front of the camera. <laughs> That's so great. Curiosity is not something unique to humans. Yeah. Everywhere in nature, amazing. And then we go to something very popular now. There are people still maybe in um, of Magdalena Bay feeding or not feeding, um, seeing the feeding by the marlin on the mackerel. Right. But what, was, but what was interesting is unfortunately my trip supposed to go by the in next week. I had to cancel it because of the pandemic and the customer could not come from Europe. But images from last year, as you see here, the interesting about the billfish that they are, no matter how big they are, they are very concerned about the bill. They and are. They will, because if it break, they cannot feed. So they use the bill to move one fish out of the, of the bait bowl because then seals and uh, brides well coming in and feeding on the same bait bowl and they cannot compete with them. So they move one fish out and take it. And there's a precision, they take less than three tenths of a second that I was able to catch this moment from the moment you catch the fish, move it and swallow it. Huh. It's like using a chopstick. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but only one chopstick in this case. It, it, that's extraordinary. I don't think that was known until people were able to get in the water and observe them on their own terms. You know, most people have seen billfish 
either on the wall. Yeah. Or dead. On a plate. <laughs> yeah, dead. <laughs> Strung up by the tail. Somehow. It's but just awful. Imagine the magnificence of these creatures. Why would anyone want them dead? They are just miracles, every one of them. And everyone unique. There are no two like everything else. There, everyone is an individual. And this this image, almost, <laughs> that's a miracle too, how it you really were able is. to get everything exactly lined up, the right moment, the right skill, the right fish, the right two fish, <laughs> one fish, two fish, almost fish. Blue fish. <laughs> Yeah. Patient, patient, patient. I must say just harmony. Let the let the ocean do its own things and we the observer. We just the visitor there and bring it home and hopefully enrich so many other people like we have with us now about 117 people. Yeah. So you mean you did not actually have that's not a stuffed fish. No, <laughs> <laughs> no I'm unfortunately not. And this is not stuffed. Crocodile, Nile crocodile. Oh, no, it's you know, there's some eye. big animals in freshwater environments too. And you know, <laughs> you're diving with this crocodile. I mean, it's like the shark. They, you know, maybe sometimes they might mistake a diver for food, but when when you're in the water with them like this, they seem and you're approaching them correctly, they're they're quite relaxed. Not not just that, they cannot feed underwater. They That's cannot true. feed underwater. They have a stop in the throat that if they open the mouth, they will swallow water. Yeah. They cannot they cannot feed underwater. So the old movies that we've seen in, in a different television program, they all feed on the surface, catching the wildebeest and the zebra. Right. They mm. bring them to the water, but they don't feed underwater. They don't pray there. They have to take cut a piece, come to the surface, eat it, and go back under. And they most of the time spend their time on the land, not in the water. They can go underwater, they're amphibious. They can go in the water, but they're not designed to live in the water. Mm -hmm. And that is what, again, my effort with camera and with people and together with the time with Sylvie and Jeannie to be able to show to the world, there are different ways to look at the animal, other way to be able to connect with the environment that we are in, to be able to live in peace and in reason, because we can reason, they can't. That's right. Just look at that that toothy smile. That's another one for the <laughs> dentist office. That's right. So I think we've got a little uh, video clip next that shows that sometimes when you're uh, taking underwater f photographs, you're not even really um, taking a picture of an animal that lives underwater. <laughs> so <laughs> have a look at that. Let's see if it play here for us. Yes. Come on. Time we went to Okamanga Delta. Beside the clock, I try also to photograph to picture the fish eagle, how they feed. And since the conversation is about photography and how photographers behave in the environment, we study the eagle first. How the eagle prey on the day, the float on the river. And we, Ambush it, and be able to see it on the surface. And then I went underwater by a floating fish, and could be able to know that in 30 seconds the eagle will come and catch it. Amazing. That's the fish I view. <laughs> and then they got together with the prey. Amazing. Oh, lovely. The motion. <laughs> I guess so. Got the shot. <laughs> All right. Whoa. That was amazing. But it is the work that you do and that we do as your mom does as a researcher 
uh, and as a leader and preparing her messer, messages to the world, uh, to the different dignitary around the world. We need to prepare, we need to study our subject well, to know how to do it and do it with a team and do it safely and bring it back to the world. And then we give them a chance to uplift themselves, to inspire them to be different. Right. To get so, to see a polar bear the way a polar bear sees a polar bear, you know, they're, they're, they're not out there to get us. We're not really on their menu. We're no. newcomers in their world. We truly are, and, and you know they're considered to be the, the top predator around in the, the Arctic, Arctic yeah. in the Arctic Circle. Well, we're and, the top predator. Yeah. Come on. And you know we we have sometimes we are actually on these guys' menu, <laughs> occasionally. Oh, yeah, but but it's you know there are circumstances that, or that's the unusual. That's the unusual exactly. The effort, and the effort because the animal been described, the polar bear described as a, as you said the top predators. I was looking for a moment where it not looks so, uh, so scary or so frightening. At the moment it is asleep, something that you, you've never seen about animal asleep. Well, we saw the blue whale, now we see the polar bear. They are both mammals and they're both sleeping also. Yeah. They are very vulnerable in this moment. How we get close and safely in this animal and to be able to bring everybody home. So that was shooting from a distance. Lots of glass, yes. <laughs> lots of glass. <laughs> a lot of glass. Yeah. And a lot of patient on the ice. Yeah. And uh, no matter how much glass you have, if you don't have patient on the ice, you'll never get there. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> and then to see when she is there, totally vulnerable, totally giving herself to the young one. And she has nothing to be afraid of except us. We have to be very responsible that she can feed them well. So I have to hold my people back 50 yards away and bring right. all the glass that you can if you want to see that. Then it's a privilege to be there. Right, and then to just be so respectful of these animals. Don't disturb them. No. And that them. it's so tender that the young one just going into the nipple of the mother and she's totally focused only on one thing, nothing else. Yeah, she's not, you know, staring at you and or staring at others. She's just doing her own behavior there with the cubs. Well, we had to be very careful, as you see here, to be a distance away, waiting, seeing, and not approaching, not being aggressive just to get the picture. We tried one day, two days, three days, and eventually you get it. But right. it's all about taking the time. And the guy, the one sitting the most on the left, the local guide, I must say, the unsung heroes for all this picture, or for all what we do, there are unsung heroes of those guides that live there. And I thank you for this, uh, for this case, for the guy that was with us, to be able to understand the polar bear, understand the ice, the sun, the light that I, I'm governing, and he governed the behavior of the animal and how to bring it together so people can take the picture. He looks almost as relaxed as the polar bear. <laughs> <laughs> And here's the patient, we had to sit while she was smelling the hole of the ringet seal where the young one is there, but she will not take the young one. She's waiting for the mother of the ringet seal to come in. It took hours. We sat there almost four hours waiting for the moment when she stood up, break the ice. And when she did, everybody was behind the camera and with the long legs catching this rare, 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 rare image one of its kind uh, on steel when she pick up the, the, the ringet seal out of the hole and predation. Wow. That's amazing. It's making photographs rather than just taking photographs. I have to admit almost that I take a lot of photographs. I use my camera as a notebook, but waiting for the story images to be able to get those special moments that's your genius and it, it, it's understanding the animals respecting the animals and in your mind you know the image you would like to be able to get but you have to wait until the animals are ready to share their share themselves with you and it's it's so worth the wait four hours Imagine being in a restaurant waiting four hours for dinner. 
<laughs> but imagine making the decision to go into the water with the polar bear. That's, even, oh. That's another decision for all kinds. For all kinds. We're three. You're We're three. three. So, Thank you very much, Sylvie. Thank you. Coming from you, from the life experience that you have and you, and the message that you brought us to the world, um, it is, to me, it is great honor and I tremendously respect it. Wow. But, well, just taking a picture of the polar bear on the surface was one and anaconda and Nile crocodile and great white and orcas and blue whale and humpback whale. But to be with the polar bear was a mission that took almost 15 years to achieve that eventually I was able together with a young team of Israeli uh, producer and, uh, and directors that followed me and together with Adam Ravitch, the, re the remarkable filmmaker, as he took a, this picture of me photographing the polar bear passing over my, our head uh, five years ago in Canada. Just look at the way they're, they're looking down at you like, what on earth is that? <laughs> <laughs> well, very clearly, we were, Adam and I were treading water for almost 30 minutes as the polar bear was coming from one island to the next island, and we did not move. We let them come toward us if they wanted to. If they would pass away five meters to my left, 15 feet to my left, or to my right or to my left, I will never be able to take their picture. Yeah. Only because she was curious of us and she, and she realized we were not aggressive. We never made a step closer to her. She made all the way directly at us and over our head. It was remarkable, and not just one mother and two cubs. Sylvie, yeah. I did not even think about two cubs. I said, I pray for one. As <laughs> <laughs> a double dividend. <laughs> yeah, one for Adam, one for me. <laughs> <laughs> it was. And no, the, the, this. the story of of this image, or the the image of the mother and her cubs looking down at you, that's the subject of the film that is just remarkable it's just what is it the picture of your picture life of his life yeah picture of his life it's you, it is the picture of your life but it's also the, that image that you dreamed about but you made you made the dream come true in partnership with that mother bear and her and her two little ones look at this guy and, just kind of cruising and adam, and adam Ravitch and the yeah. inuit family again the hansung heroes oh I, the Inuit family that help us tremendously on the land and on the water to bring us to the right place from there on is was up to Adam and myself to yeah. make it happen and to dive it to trust each other to trust ourselves and trust each other have confidence that we can do it and here we are now I know Adam Ravitch and he's yes. almost as crazy and wonderful as you are <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that again brothers. is a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> You're true brothers. And Look at that. And as you see oh. here, like we did a picture of the of the of the great white silhouette over my head. I wanted to get something similar, and God and behold, I got the opportunity. Oh. And this mother and two cub just over my head. One oh, great man. white, one polar bear. There is no danger in the world. It is only our responsibility to be in harmony with Mother Nature. Yeah, I mean, she's completely unconcerned about what you're doing or where you are. She's just kind of cruising through, right? And, and curious, but curious, not, not aggressive, concerned. not mm. concerned. Yeah, <laughs> that's my only. That's my only weapon: my cam the camera <laughs> and my smile. <laughs> smile to the world. So, we've got the we've got the trailer for the. For the movie here so we'll look at we'll look at this yeah it's only two minutes it's only a couple of minutes and right. then um we're and then i will uh move on we'll take some questions from people so um i think we've got a lot of questions in the queue that we'll get to and then um we'll do the raising hands but let's go let's check this out amos to me is uh, one of the best ambassadors of the ocean takes huge amount of risks to bring those images which nobody else has ever been able to capture. He comes back with images that no one can get. He is probably the best. 
underwater still photographer in the world. His story was always shredded in mystery. He doesn't have a normal life. He doesn't have children. He's married to the ocean. He has this passion. He wants to be in the water, close to that polar bear, swim with the biggest predator on Earth. If the wind is too turbulent, we're not going to go there. There's so many factors that can work against you. All right, guys, we're taking off. Uh... Almost and his team have only five days to find a polar bear and take the picture. It's the one animal where humans are part of their food chain. People get eaten by polar bears. He needs that adrenaline rush. He needs to be at the edge. And if he doesn't do it in one way, he'll do it in another way. And maybe his military background has hard to do with it. What happened to Amos in the army is a mystery to me. He didn't come home, really. I can see blue sky compared to seeing flames. I wonder if there is some kind of unfinished business with the polar bear. You're living in yourself and you go all the way with no matter what else. And this is all the power of being here. Almost wants to prove that those large animals aren't our enemies and that we can live with them in harmony. No, no. Difficulty. Oh no. <laughs> You're having difficulty to stop the sharing here. <laughs> yes, I have okay. not had this happen before, yeah. but see what happens here. <laughs> try pushing the escape. Oh my hmm. goodness. Okay, almost you did this to me with this uh hey, Jessica stop the sharing, yeah. That's what I did. The question. Huh. All I had right. to push two places. <laughs> <laughs> in the right place. In the right, place. right yeah, yeah. yeah. And maybe it's an indication to us, yeah. Exactly. All right. All right. So let's get on here to some questions. Let's see. Stephanie wants to know, almost, what is your favorite underwater spot to photograph? There is no such thing. <laughs> All any place, anywhere in the water, you go tomorrow to the Caribbean, you go to Mexico, you go to Canada, you go to Antarctica. Each place has its own uniqueness. Yes, from the point of view, because like Sylvie, like myself, we had a lot of chances. We do it for our life. From your point of view, as a traveler, that you do it maybe once or twice a year, it is more opinion question, more you have you want to get the most out of your time and money so the question is you need to ask tell me ask me what you are mostly interested in. there will be a blue well i'll be anaconda will be the beautiful reef of uh, raja ampat will be the red sea between the desert and the and the water each place is on uniqueness the question is what do you want and then we'll be able to govern to direct you other still be with their experience either you want to participate in the um, in the um, uh, turtle conservation either you want to participate in well research that what I do with the blue well, depend on the venue that you want to participate, we'll be able to direct you. Excellent. Uh, Sherry is asking, how long was that blue whale that, that was there with you? I had the chance to be with several blue whale, not only one, but the one in Sri Lanka was about 60, 65 feet. The one in California, about 80 feet long. And um, that is the largest I've ever seen, yeah. I'm planning to go to the Costa Rica Dome, hopefully after the pandemic in March. Um, 
to be able to see them probably the largest one, what they call the Blue Well Cafe, where we're going to see the largest and the numbers of Blue Well, Say Well, and Feel Well as well. Um, Brett is asking us, he says, hey, mate. <laughs> um, <laughs> wait a minute, here we go. How do you manage your clients that aren't so considerate of the animals and just are focused on getting the shot? Very, very good. Well, one of the first things I take only four, two or four people, six the most depend on the trick. And if, we, if I take and no more than two people in the water at the same time, and the people alongside with me. When the person in the past had a problem or did not uh, uh, properly measure his weight and was overweighted and had to go, went diving deep, I had to pull him out, put him back on the boat and make sure that he'll be properly uh, weighted next time. Usually I weight, I weight the people and make them do the weighting of themselves before we go engaging with the wild animal because Buoyancy control is number one important element in the water. When I see the people, how they act and how they put themselves the wet, the wetsuit, the tank, and the weight, I know what to expect and the, and the skills. So, um, most of the trip are open to most people to join, not, a, not difficulty, but for the polar bear, by the way, the second time I asked today, I don't take anyone on a trip if it's the first time I ever die with them. I asked them to join me on one of other trip, Blue Well, Humpback Well, Orcas, Great White. And after the experience, they and I have worked together and learned to trust each other. Only then, no matter how much money you put in, <laughs> it's not the issue. It is safety is number one. Yeah. I've worked for 45 years and I never have immaculate safety record. And I want to keep it, especially now in this age of my life. <laughs> So if, if they misbehave, almost, you can always put a cork in their snorkel. <laughs> <laughs> True enough. Very good. You're yeah. grounded. You're yeah. grounded. Always, always, always learn something from the elder. That's right. <laughs> put them on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> so Jane is asking us on the, uh, on the white sharks, what are the black lines that were on their face? Or the marking because of other sharks biting into each other and how they're fighting with each other. So uh, it's the scars and things. Yeah, the scar. yeah. They're distinctive, but, but you don't need the scars to tell them apart. <laughs> 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 you want to give give um, those raising hands a chance? Are there some? Um, let's see. I'll check in with Gigi. Do we have anybody that's got a raised hand that we want to call on? Yes, we have uh, two people. Okay. Let me uh, open up uh, April. April, why don't you uh, unmute yourself and ask your question? Well, hello everybody. It's really an honor to talk with y'all again. All three of y'all are amazing and I admire all three of y'all's work and y'all's passion for the environment. Um, and most after you were on the last time, I, I decided to go look and, and watch the film um, Oh no, now I'm all nervous and I can't, I can't say the title picture of his life. And it, it brought so many emotions out of me. Um, how, you know, you're so vulnerable to share your life with us and how your, your father wasn't approving at first and so forth. Like I just, and it, there's just so many lessons besides protecting wildlife. It's never stop learning. Um, always achieve, you know, go after your goals. And I just want to say thank you for opening up your your life to that so we can experience that. And also, I think this should be available to a wider audience. Is there is there a way to, to bring this film out um, like on a streaming service or to a, a wider audience? Hmm. So, do you have it out available, Amos? Is it available? The movie? The film, yeah. The movie is not available open on a streaming, but people can rent it. And if you go to uh, the website, uh, pictureofhislife.com slash big animals, you can rent it. It's for $9.99 or $19.99, depends for how long you want to be able to see it. 
So big and um, picture of his life dot com slash big animals. Great, thank you. Okay, oh, we forward. have uh, more people with raised hands. Uh, Sonia, unmute yourself, please. Um, hi, I'm Izzy. I'm 12 years old. And that was really cool seeing all those photos and you sharing your experiences. Um, I, I've always loved the ocean. My parents have loved the ocean and I'm lucky to grow up in that kind of family because I've always had access to the ocean and access to all of those films. But how would you get the people that aren't able to like access the films and the photos that I am able to? I, I like watching them and I enjoy it because my parents introduced it to me, but how would you get the people that don't have that introduced? Well, uh, to get access to my picture, you go to uh, biganimal.com, which is the website with the expedition and many pictures from the different destinations. Um, there is also the ability to rent the movie. And if you send me your email, uh, I'm also at biganimal.com, I'll send you the link to the, um, to the trailer for the movie. So you can have it and from there on be able to see the movie if you like. That's great. Thank you. Do we have any other raised hands, Gigi, or should we go back to the other questions? Uh, Kayleen, you can ask your question. Hi, Amos. It's uh, Dr. Lewis's wife, Kayleen. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Very well. How are you? Good, good. I just absolutely love this. Uh, it was just wonderful. I miss the Blue Ocean Film Festival so much, and this was just a great hour. But I was wondering, how often do you go and do the polar bear um, expedition? Okay, every animal at the peak performance time of the year. So, like, if you want to go skiing, you go in January, February, March is the best time. So the same thing about the blue whale have a particular time, the great white, the polar bear on the ice, the best time and the way I do it is in Svalbard, usually around April, March or April. It is cold, but it's the time when the polar bear just come out of the den. She is hungry because she was giving birth. She has two young ones. She need to feed them and they feed from her. So that's the time, the critical time to see the relationship, how she nursing them, and how she feed. So for underwater is different timing, different location altogether. And the timing usually when the ice mostly already been reside, res, reside? no, uh, been melted <laughs> yeah. out of the particular fjord that we are looking for. The, the idea in this case is to be in an area where polar bear most likely did not see people before. That is the fundamental ingredients to be with wild animal, not one that already have a flavor of being in town and feeding on the garbage and go back in and out. Is to be able to be in with wild animal and then it's easier for me and for the team to be able to relate to them as a wild animal, not the one that already have a different view of uh, people interaction. So you could go on the um, on a polar bear expedition that would be um, on land because um, my diving in temperatures under 80 degrees are over now. <laughs> <laughs> Although I will tell, Dr. Earl inspires me, to, but I just I'm more of a 80 degree Solomon Islander girl now, you know, but you could go on land and see the polar bears and do that one then. Yes, well, I don't do it on land. It will be on the ice, right. the, on the fjord in, no, in Svalbard. Um, it is still cold, but we will give you the proper clothing, the boots, the hat, the overall, all this to keep you warm as much as possible. Each one of us is a little bit different, but we'll give you the clothing that will help you to keep warmer. Yes. That's awesome. Okay, hey, we have a couple more. Uh, okay. Lindsay, unmute yourself, please. Hi, Sylvia. Hi, Liz. Hey, Amos. <laughs> Thank you so much for creating this space and sharing your stories. It's been really inspiring. Uh, my question for you, Amos, is do you have any specific stories you want to share on top of everything you've shared where you've returned to locations and really witness this visible environmental or ocean change and things that you can learn from that? 
I think it's so important to, to hear from you all who live and breathe the ocean and see and witness these changes. Thank you. Thank you too, Lindsay. Thank you very much for the question, which could be almost summarizing the meeting. Uh, one, one of the important things is as a result of the pandemic, um, I decided the next generation of expedition we're going to run, it will be together with Sylvie and with Mission Blue, uh, more, into the, more into the research um, and more, not just to take picture, not just to have adventure, but also bring knowledge that researchers need in order to enrich their information. So one of the big, uh, one of the, um, one of the major operations for the next 18 months is looking for blue well, because what uh, Liz said earlier about the shipping lane and the noise in the water, uh, as there will be less noise right now, those blue well will come more into their natural um, ship, natural, uh, natural navigation line will be easier for us as human to interact with them or to find them. Mm. <laughs> so there are four trips that I design, especially for the Blue Well, will be for the Costa Rica Dom, Blue Well Cafe, to Timor Leste, to uh, the Azores, and hopefully with Sylvie to Sri Lanka. And that will be the focus uh, that I would like to bring in um, and more education, more knowledge, empower the information that we have about Blue Well. I have my own special few trips or few projects that I want to lead, which are mostly after so many years of doing that with people. There are one or two trips I want to do by myself, and there are more for threatened and one of the most threatened and most endangered animal. And one of them will be the uh, Siberian tiger and the other one for clouded leopard. Mm. <laughs> Uh, both of them are on a version extinction. There are only four or five hundred of them left in the world. They are very difficult to be found. A lot of research been taking place that I've put in the past two or three years. The pandemic gave me an opportunity that I did not dream. So everything difficult have also silver lining in it. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Emma, please unmute yourself. Hi, um, my name is Emma. Um, I'm from Boston. Um, thank you so much for sharing your stories. Um, it's especially meaningful for me um, hearing an Israeli wildlife photographer. Um, I have never, I didn't know that, you know, that was a thing. Um, <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in Israel um, over the course of my life, um, and I'm thinking of moving there um, and being such a passionate um, person about marine life and conservation. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, what kinds of things did you do around Israel in regards to photographing animals? Um, and just reading about Jacques Cousteau and his adventures in the Red Sea made me think a lot about the kinds of things that maybe I would someday be able to do around that area. Just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, there are several issues that you raise here. First of all, unfortunately, I don't have much experience in modern time in Israel because 45 years I've been traveling around the world. But before I came to the United States, I was diving, of course, my basic diving was in the Red Sea and I helped also creating the national park, the Red Sea as a national park uh, along the Sinai before we gave it for a peace reason with Egypt, which was very rewarding by itself. So since then, I don't have much connection what the Egyptian did in the Red Sea. What you mentioned about uh, Jacques Cousteau, which was a figure for all of us in a way, um, it, is not, it is in the Red Sea, but it's much farther south by Sudan. Luckily, just about three or four weeks ago, Sudan signed a peace treaty with Israel. <laughs> and Israel is an American, can go a little bit easier now to Sudan and to dive on the unit that um, on the batiscap that uh, Jacques, Jacques Cousteau embedded there and still there underwater. So the Red Sea is a big body of water. Uh, it's not just the one between Eilat and Sharm el -Sheikh. It goes from Eilat, from Sharm el -Sheikh all the way down to Bab el Mandeb or into Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and Sudan. Um, one of the best way to dive today in the Red Sea is via Egypt. 
and Marcel Alam, and from there to take a boat to some of the beautiful reef to Dandolo, Sabagat, and of course into Sudan, and of course to the Brother Island. But they are all mostly from the Egyptian side or through Egypt rather than through Israel. And the yeah. fish don't know where the boundaries are. That's and right. Fish don't know boundaries. They don't care. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a flag. They don't have an anthem. <laughs> so we'll go back and take a few more of the um, questions from the Q and A section. Um, Anya is asking. She's saying she wants to become a marine photographer. Mm. And do you have any tips on the best way to get started or dive in? We'll dive in. <laughs> is it best to start in an aquarium or just go directly to the ocean? Oh, the best is to start wherever you can. Never, don't stop yourself. If aquarium is closer to you, start an aquarium. Get the experience. Get to know the equipment. Know yourself. You know your buoyancy. How careful you are with the reef or the people around you. That is the first thing. I would like to mention here to all those people that in, have an aspiration to be involved like what Sylvie does or what I do. It is, somebody, somebody said it, not me. He's a very old Chinese man. And he said, a mission without a vision is a daydream. And a vision without a mission is a nightmare. <laughs> so, so for all of you guys that want to participate in the work of being a productive wildlife photographer, not only being on Facebook, but to make a living out of it, or to be a researcher and a leader like Sylvie is, and a world um, and other college speaker, you need to have a vision and then to have a mission with it. And then slowly you can climb the ladder and get to the point that also econ and economically is rewarding, spiritually is rewarding, and for the people around you, they benefit from that and they lift you up because the public is the one that lifts you up, nothing else. But providing the message, the message you bring in is from your, from your heart, from your knowledge to the people, and then they lift you up, continue, and then you do more and more and more. Awesome. So Stacy is asking us, can you talk a little bit more about the shark and the seal experience or sea lion experience and were they actually playing? The, the seal are much faster than the shark. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing for the seal. <laughs> so that's the beauty of it. The, the shark will swim closely looking at us uh, uh, leisurely and the seal come from the surface, swim very fast into the shark, nibble on his back and keep going away. And not one time, two times, three times. And the shark, sometime in the front of the face, sometime in the back of the, of the shark, and the shark did not do anything to it. And they don't do it all the time. And as uh, Mauricio, the researcher mentioned, which is one of the most well-known and familiar with the shark in Guadalupe was telling us, and he's been there every season for four or five months, anywhere from July till, till January. he has been a star of BBC, Geographic and Discovery. In many of them, everybody asked for his participation and to give the knowledge from what, what, what he study, Because we come in for a short time, a week, two or three weeks a year. He's there all the time. Right. He has an observation that is more overwhelming, overall observation rather than very narrow period of time. So when you listen to him, or I listen to him, and then be able to be in the water in, with my eyes, to be able to see and to connect and to take the next step, and then how those images and how the story come about. So it's it's easy to imagine the sea lions having fun. I mean, they do. <laughs> they're playful. They're like yeah. puppies. Yeah, they certainly play with divers. Uh, absolutely. Tug on your flippers and take your mask. Out. Yeah, <laughs> right. pull your hair. <laughs> but the shark may be less engaged, but he's not. But they're not apparently aggressive. They're passive in this. But they may actually, who knows? You have to get inside the mind of the shark to know if they're having a, a, a play session or whether they're just tolerating these, these um, pesky seals, sea lions, whichever they are. <laughs> He's like a fly on my back. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It, it is interesting that the shark will not do anything and it did not change direction, did not maybe shake his tail a little bit, 
but that's about it. It did not do any um, aggressive motion, either right. try to avoid it or to run after it. Right. It just continue its own direction and he puffed it out of his, he knows that he's bigger and he's stronger. If he need to, he will go after it, but otherwise, why bother? Yeah, why waste the energy, right? <laughs> well, that is the key about the predator. They don't waste their energy when they don't have to. Yeah. When they need to waste yeah. their energy, they are very careful because there's the rate of success, no matter what, polar bear, crocodile, po they are 30 to 40% of the time. They don't, even lion and cheetah and uh, leopard and the jaguar, they're only 30 or 40% successful, even though they put all their energy, so they're not wasted. Very good, Liz. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So Michelle has a question from uh, seven-year-old Blake. Blake. Says, yeah. Blake. <laughs> Are you ever worried about being swallowed by a whale? I saw a video where that almost happened to someone. Correct. It's happened to someone about two years ago in on a sardine one in South Africa. Um, there is no question. There is a question that I always fear is human uh, feeling. And fear is something that for me, put me more on alert, more to be aware of what happened around me. What, what do I need to do to protect myself? So I'm not afraid of going doing it, but doing it with consideration of what could happen and how to protect myself or the people around me. So that's how I manage it. So far, I've been successful. <laughs> You're still here. I cannot say about tomorrow, but I'm not a whale and not a virus caught me. And that's opportunity for everybody listen to us. Please remember, this is a virus. There's nothing we can do about to stop it, except to be protective of ourselves. And we don't see it. We don't know where it's embedded, where it was last time, where it's going to be next time. <laughs> So let's protect each other, protect ourselves and protect each other around us. It's very, very, very true. Um, I mean, a whale would not intentionally try to swallow a human. No, I think But if we put ourselves in harm's way. Yeah, and, and sometimes yeah. it is because we're, you know, a person's not really, uh, you know, reading the situation correctly or, they're, or they're, they just don't have the experience to say, oh, look, these, these this uh, bu circle of bubbles is coming up around me. <laughs> Maybe I should be worried. <laughs> Move out <laughs> or, of the way. Or they know, you know, they see like the, the flurry at the surface of, of the, the bait ball, meaning that something's chasing the fish from underneath. Um, so they may not just have the experience to know and they get, as you say, get in accidentally into harm's way and, and tip over. But the whale's not intentionally going to hurt a person, um, but they may just, they may suffer some uh, bumps and bruises. And in the case of the virus, we just need to stay out of harm's way. That's right. Again, different different scenario, but wear the mask. It's our judgment. <laughs> yeah. Wear the mask. Very, very true. Because what happens is when you lead people uh, and or with a camera, sometimes you forget. And I've seen enough situation where people put themselves in danger where they forgot the environment they're in, only to the bravado, if you want to call it. Mm -hmm. and that is the human um how do you call it downfall if you will if there is one and the question is how we deal with ourselves in relationship to the environment a very good point that you mentioned Liz and sylvie there no well want to attack us or to come after us is only by the fact that we did something not right we did not read the situation well yeah and i think sometimes in the in the case of a whale they're you know, they don't have that much experience with people in the water uh, either, you know? So sometimes they're just, you know, they're just kind of like, they don't know what we are. Yeah, like, whoops, I didn't whoops. mean to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, let's take one more question here. Uh, Gary is asking, Amos, how did you know that crocodile is not going to react out of fear <laughs> and self-defense when presented with a human in his or her domain under the water? Okay, again, if you pay attention to what I've said before, is a lot. I do some research before I read. I ask people, uh, people that have been with a croc on land, on the um, not in the water because nobody been in the water with them. Uh, before we went first time to Okavanga to do that, the same thing with the anaconda. Um, but we learn also that the sensor of the croc is along the chin, along the lower chin. So 
the idea is don't get too close to their sensor. <laughs> Simple. <laughs> so use wide angle lens and stay a, a, a meter away or two meter away. So in the beginning, we did not go, I did not go very close. I stayed two meter away. Then we did a test for a BBC and we took a pole and put a white ball on the end of the pole and put it in front, brought it very close to the eye um, one meter or one meter away from the eye of the croc and closer and closer and closer to see where the, the croc will react. And only when it was inches away from, from his face, only then he rea reacted. And we knew more or less what our, what our limitation will be, what distance we must keep or I must keep and keep my people away from the croc. That's how we learn. Yeah, and, and to your point about really, um... I thought you took an assistant along and let the, <laughs> <laughs> the sacrificial assistant. Almost his assistant, bait. Oh. <laughs> um, but it really goes back to your point about the, the gratitude we show to the, the people who live in these areas and respect, and respect the knowledge. animals and respect the knowledge that they have had over years of mm -hmm. interacting with these animals. And, um, and it, it's really an important part of being able to go into a space, especially when you have a, you know, a time constraint of an expedition. You mm -hmm. do all that research and you, you, know, you kind of try to plan for it, but you, you need the people who are really more intimate with that particular environment. You mentioned very interesting, if I have a moment, about the question of limited time and limited money. Uh, to do, or time and money, those issues coming from the Western philosophy compared to the Eastern philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, since I, do, I did everything myself for all these years, together with people like Sylvie, Stan Waterman, Jeannie Clark, David Duvillé, that helped me on the way where I mentor. But I did it all on my own terms. And I realized that I could not, because of lack of time or lack of money to push, and that's important for this conversation about ethics, not to push myself against just to get the picture. Right. I had to take my time. And if you rem remember the, the first the slide was, is a year of ontology of being in a wilderness on the edge of comfort and common sense. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, it's not because many of my friends are much better off than I am. They have a house or two houses, the two or three cars and who knows what. But I have a story that nobody ever has, but Sylvie. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the, that's the difference, is the patient it took me so many years to be able to be there and not limit myself or push myself because of time and money, but because of the message uh, or the, des the personal desire that I want to be able to achieve and to show to the world that we can live in peace and we care about the animal for future generation and how to make it happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, absolutely. That's the bottom. I lost you, ladies. <laughs> okay, Even now, that crocodile. Now I hear you. I yeah. Hear you. Oh, we just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We're just saying we hope you can go back and see some of those same animals again and again because they're very long lived. <laughs> uh, that's right. Hopefully Sorry, no. we did something today between you two and thank you for the invitation again to share with you the stage and have so many people with us. Yeah, it's been wonderful. So, but it is time for us to uh, close out for today. And I just wanted to say that um, Sylvia and I and Amos, thank you for joining us and thanks to all of you for joining us uh, today. and during our other episodes as well. Um, we'd like to thank our producers and partners, Ocean Elders and Medley Media. We hope our co-producer Arnold will be back to join us in the near future and keep coming back month after month. Yes. <laughs> Happy, <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving. Happy yeah. Thanksgiving to all. Yes, we should all be thankful and grateful. And we are, you know, Divin mm -hmm. is really feeling like home to us and, and we hope that you, everyone feels the same way and you'll keep coming back and send us some suggestions of what you'd like us to talk with. And um, I'm sure we'll bring almost back again at some Absolutely. point. Absolutely, <laughs> He hasn't shown us all his pictures by a lot. <laughs> More adventures to come. More adventures to come together. Yes. But we're so thankful to everyone. 
And we will be back in December. We're going to take a couple weeks off. We'll be back in December. And we're going to be uh, talking about oysters. Oysters. And, yeah, and oh. why they're more valuable. or the, the value they have beyond being on a plate with some uh, lemon squeezed on them. Uh, <laughs> and we'll talk about their role in coastal resilience. So uh, this episode and all the past episodes that we've had are available on the Ocean Elders YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So... Um, we're going to close out for now, but before we do, we want to remind everyone to take care of the ocean. As if your life depends on it, because it, it does. does. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Be safe, be well, wear your mask. Yes. <laughs> our mask? Underwater and above water. Where is the mask? Oh. Oh. No, 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 our face mask. Our dive. <laughs> we don't know where the dive mask is, but we have this one in the meantime. <laughs> That's right. Here we so go. wear it and be well. Okay. Be with us again soon. Oh, okay. Kind ending. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.